Hey guys, Stockaholics. Thank you guys for being here today. I wanted to make a video about shipping again and uh, more specifically on super cycles or periods of time in which uh, shipping does extremely well. <laughs> and I think that's how most investors see those anyway. Um, I wanted to take a deep dive on what I think causes shipping super cycles in at least the current global system that we have. <laughs> um, I wanted to do that by taking a look at a lot of the conditions that were present uh, in the last super cycle and compare those to a lot of the conditions that we are now seeing again in this, I believe, uh, super cycle that we are just starting. Okay, I wanted to start by showing you guys this. This is a picture of the global order book for dry bulk product tankers, crude oil tankers, and container ships from the year 2000 to the year 2020. Quick note, this isn't uh, as accurate anymore. Um, these three vessel classes, crude oil, product tankers, and dry bulks, are about the same area uh, on this chart. However, containers are at an all-time uh, high in terms of ordering because of some unique conditions related to the pandemic. Now, I wanted to show you guys this for a couple of reasons. The first reason is to show you guys that shipping cycles are very, very long. In my opinion, I think this chart very well represents a shipping long cycle. And I think that we are again starting uh, an up cycle, uh, which I'll explain in this video too. Uh, this is and this is a cycle that took about 20 years from trough to trough okay now there is a period of from about 2000 to about 2008 in which you can see that all of the vessel classes were being ordered in increasing numbers and that's because all of these vessel classes have a common denominator and that common denominator is global gdp growth as global gdp uh expands and rapidly uh the uh demand for containers, the demand for all of these things transported on these ships increases rapidly, right? And usually above the rate of the actual supply of these vessel, vessels on the water, right? So what these, uh, all of these owners of ships and these shipping companies, what they did during this time period, because they had uh, better and better earnings over time, they reinvested into their business, they ordered more ships, and you saw a massive, massive order book by the year about 2008, right? Now what changed afterwards is global GDP didn't grow at the same rate that it did from this period to this time period anymore. And um, it didn't contract, but it just didn't grow at the same rate. So what they had uh, on their hands were a tremendous amount of uh, ships trying to uh, satiate a demand that was kind of not there anymore. So they ordered less and less ships for a period of time. Now, in my opinion, the conditions that led to this rapid uh, expansion phase in the global economy, I think that those are again present. And I wanted to explain why. Okay, I wanted to start by showing you guys uh, this. This is what a lot of economists, people, shipping people, uh, consider the drivers of the last shipping super, super cycle from these in these early 2000s to the global financial crisis, okay? From 2000 to 2008, Brazil, China, India, Russia, and South Africa, their economies were all rapidly, rapidly growing. Uh, China alone, uh, their GDP growth could probably uh, dictate a tremendous amount of uh, global commodities demand. Uh, so uh, anyway, these you can see that there is a period where they all rapidly, rapidly grew, right? There was the global financial crisis. And then afterwards, there was a period where they uh, were all kind of, they were growing, but they weren't growing at the same rate that they were over here, right? And you can see that this pretty much illustrates the same story that we were talking about before. The global uh, order book increased rapidly for a period of time, and it was still increasing, but that rate of expansion uh, was contracting over time, right? Same idea over here, right? Now, I think that the, there's a reason we can explain why all of these economies rapidly grew from this time period to this time period and why they were languishing from this time to this period to this period again. And I think that the common denominator, which I'm going to show you guys in several charts, is the United States. Okay, as mentioned, I thought that the United States is the common denominator between all of the BRIC's growth in the last uh, shipping super cycle. And that is because the common denominator between all of these countries' growth, in my opinion, is the global reserve currency or the United States dollar. 
I think what has actually driven the last uh, super cycle in shipping, shipping was a rapid expansion in the amount of US dollars being created. Okay, this is a chart of the United States inflation rate year over year. That is this blue line. So what that means uh, year over year, if this line is increasing, that tells you that you should see increasing amounts of currency units being created. If it's decreasing, then that should show you that there is decreasing amounts of currency units relative to the previous year being created. Now, this is a little bit more complicated because the way that the United States measures inflation is through goods and services, not the amount of currency uh, in that uh, currency units directly. So this, this line is a little bit hazy in that regard. But generally speaking, if you see this going up, it means that more currency units are being created. If you see it going down, that means that less <laughs> currency units are being created relative to the previous year. Okay, uh, this orange line, again, is the Baltic Dry Index. And this is the rates that the bulker uh, shipping segment is earning. And you can, and by the way, you can overlay this with like any of the uh, uh, shipping segments, whatever, uh, you know, the, the Baltic or the, the dirty tanker index, clean tanker index, the freight rate index, there's a similar pattern here. Again, because they're all related to global GDP growth, right? Okay, now what happened in 2000 and 2008, you can see that there's a period here that they are, the global, the, the amount of dollars being created was increasing year over year during that time period. And at first, it might not look like there's a lot, whole lot of dollars being created. You're like, okay, well, it kind of seems like there's a relationship here. Um, I guess, you know, does this growth really justify this amount of uh, rates in the Baltic index? Um, I, I think it does. And I'm going to show you that the, although there was a tremendous amount of dollars being created during this time period, a lot of those dollars were being exported. So another way to say that, that inflation was being exported during that time. We did not see that locally as measured in the U.S. economy. We saw it uh, in the basically basically you see it in the Baltic Dry Index being measured. OK, and um, again, we can see that the inflation rate year over year uh, rapidly expanding. Uh, and at the same time, th during this time, we can see that it's again, the Baltic Dry Index rapidly expanding. And again, over here, the inflation rate, not that you didn't see a tremendous amount of growth year over year during this time period. At the same time, you saw Baltic Dry Index rates languishing. Kind of expand a little bit more on that last topic I was talking about. Uh, from 2003 to 2008, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, inflation was exported. So instead of those dollars being trapped in the United States economy and those dollars being measured through good uh, price increases in goods and services, they instead were being exported to the rest of the world. Okay, So you can see that as measured through the United States trade deficit. So what this is showing you, another way to think about this, is that there's for every dollar leaving the United States, there are less dollars coming back. And then again, that's because it's the global reserve currency those dollars go to different parts of the world to fuel the global economy, right? So again, even though we saw inflation increasing during this time period from 2003 to 2008, there was a decrease of inflation being measured in the U.S. economy. So there was a lot of money being created during this time period. During this time period, there was not a lot of money being created during this time period. And recently, there was a tremendous amount of money being created during this time period. And what even really blows my mind is if you look at this chart, if you look at how much of those dollars left the economy, we still have an 8% inflation rate <laughs> during this time period. So that really just tells you that there was just so much money being pumped into the, the system this time. And I'm gonna to explain to you why. I mean, obviously it's because the mechanism for creating dollars changed. During this period of time, from 2000 to 2008, it was bank living lending. During this period of time, last couple of years, it was government-driven stimulus, which is injecting money, uh, printing money into the economy. Okay, now why I think the commodity super cycle is uh, starting again uh, in, in terms of demand exceeding supply is not because of this. Okay. 
this might happen. <laughs> there could be very much more government stimulus. I mean, if it happened once, it might happen again. But instead, it's because we can see signs that this period of time is happening again. There is increasing amounts of bank and uh, bank driven lending or money creation happening through private banks. Okay. This is loans and leases in bank credit for all commercial banks. It's a very sophisticated way of saying money printing. All right. This is because when a bank issues a loan to someone, whether that's a student loan, whether that's a car loan, whether that's a home loan, it's a whatever you want loan. Whenever a bank issues a loan to somebody, they create money. Okay. This is a product of the fractional reserve currency system that we have. All right. So it's a fancy way of saying, this is how much money is being printed by banks over time, okay? People think, well, it's the Federal Reserve. No, it's actually the private banking system, okay? Now, if you look from 2000 to 2008, you can see that the rate of change, the amount of dollars being created during this time period far exceeds the prior one, okay? I think you had $2, billion, or $2 trillion being created from approximately 1990 to 2000, not even that much. But you can see there was over that much created in uh, seven years, six years, from 2003 to 2008. It very similarly matches the growth that you see in the BRACs, very similarly matches the growth that you see in the Baltic Dry Index or any other shipping index for that matter, okay? And then there was the global financial crisis. Now, I don't know exactly what these gigantic moves are up here. I'm gonna assume that that's uh, government stimulus bailing out the banks because I wouldn't know how else to explain these because that's what this one was here. This uh, loan right here, um, coming from the private banks, were PPP loans. Now these, the reason this time banks gave out loans to basically anybody in the economy is because they were government backed. So the, the banks were able to issue loans basically at low risk because they know the government can print money and pay them back, right? This is the cause of the gigantic or one of the causes of the gigantic inflation rate that we have now, just a ginormous amount of money being created in a very short window of time, okay? Now, what you should be able to see though in this chart is that, yeah, bank driven dren <laughs> why is that so hard to say? <laughs> bank driven lending during this, uh, this short time period here, not that high, okay? Makes sense because you're in a pandemic uh, banks are probably risk averse. They're like, oh, yeah, I don't know if uh, Joe's going to, Skyler is going to be able to pay back this loan if I go and issue it to them, right? Something's changed. Now you can see that bank driven lending is rapidly ticking upwards. We are again entering a time period similar from 2003 to 2008. That's a bold claim. How could you know such a thing? Okay, so. What drives inflation? Well, how do you create money? Well, there's the different types of loans, traditionally, right? Aside from government uh, printed money, right? That we've recently seen. That, By the way, that does not happen uh, the way that a lot of other people think. QE is, is different. I, I can make a whole video on that. I, I might. But anyway, the, the primary way through the traditional system that we have set up, the fractional reserve banking system, is through different types of loans, okay? So these are distribution of American consumer debt. Another way to think about this pie chart is this is the amount of dollar creation by loan type, okay? And you can see that the main driver of inflation, the main driver of US dollar creation, the main driver of the BRIC's growth in the 2000, 2008 period is none other then mortgages. When a bank gives a loan for a mortgage, it's printing that money. What was taking place from that time period from 2003 to 2008? A gigantic housing bubble. It's kind of a sick way to think about the entire global growth that we saw from the 2000s was predicated on a gigantic housing bubble in the United States. But that's exactly what it was. <laughs> it was a gigantic housing bubble. And you can see that, right? So this is new privately owned housing starts uh, in the United States. These are the houses being built, right? Um, and then you can see that there's some very clear cycles here from, you know, 1990 to 2000. You're kind of below average, below, there was not a tremendous amount of uh, dollars being created through this mechanism. But from 2003 to 2006, and remember 2007, this was the exact point 
where the bricks stopped. That's when their growth ended. And then we saw a gigantic, massive crash in both the housing market and the global economy. And after that time period, there was a recovery phase. And now we are entering again an expansionary phase in the United States real estate. But this time it's not a bubble, okay? I don't care what anybody says about on Twitter, housing prices are extraordinary, people can't afford it, blah, 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 blah. It's time it is not like it was back then. There was a tremendous amount of euphoria in the housing market, and this was a bubble. You can see it in all kinds of metrics. This time it's not. This time it's predicated on demographics. Okay, uh, I wanted to show you guys this chart. Uh, I know there's a few things going on on this chart. Uh, it really wants to show you that the repeat uh, buyer's age for housing is increasing over time. But what I really wanted to draw your attention to is this. It's the average age of first time home buyers. And that's this white line. One way to think about this is that first time buyers, they represent a marginal increase in the demand for homes, okay? Now, if that, another way to think about that is if you have less 30 year olds, then that which should mean that the marginal demand for you know, new first time home buyers should decrease over time. If you see that this is increasing or the, your population of 30 year olds uh, around that age is increasing, then that should mean that your marginal demand for new first time buyers should increase. Or another way to think about that is that if you see a lot of 30 year olds and you have an increasing population of 30 year olds, then you should have more mortgages happening. You should have more dollar creation through the mechanism of the private banking system happening or more dollar creation if you have a lot of 30 year olds. Okay. Another way to think about all of that is our entire global economy is predicated on US demographics. And so this is what I wanted to show you guys, okay? So what you can see here, unlike a lot of other economies in the world, in the Western world especially, boomers did something different than basically anywhere else in the US. And they had kids. <laughs> they had a lot of kids. The, they had a lot of millennials, as they are tend to be called, okay? And like I mentioned, US 30-something-year-olds, uh, they drive the global economy. Yes, that's partly because we consume a lot, 30-year-olds uh, anywhere. They tend to be the people who, you know, they go out and they buy the most things in the economy. They tend to, to you know, use the most services in the economy. But they also are the people who, who generate the most debt. <laughs> they create the most credit in the economy, right? And this is a US histogram of the United States from uh, in 2022. And what this is demonstrating to you is that we have an expanding amount of 30 year olds for about the next five to seven years, okay? So what that represents essentially is that you should see an increasing amount of loans based on bodies, based on the amount of millennials for the next five to 10 ish years. Okay. And the, yeah, it's going to, a lot of that's going to come from housing, but that might also come from business loans that might come from car loans as these guys enter their peak consumption years. Okay. And Really, this is something akin, this is something that in terms of bank-driven bank lending <laughs> that we have not seen in a very long time. We have not had an expanding demographic in the United States since the 1970s. This is something entirely new, okay? And the amount of dollars being created during this time period is going to increase, in my opinion, uh, tremendously. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know this. I guess it could seem like that's a lot. Uh, I, I've been down a lot of rabbit holes um, making this video. I've been probably researching this stuff for several months now. But I'm, I know, and maybe it sounds nuts. I don't, I don't know. You guys, can, I mean, you know, maybe it's just two A B C D E F G. It's, maybe there's too many variables. Maybe it seems like the, it doesn't seem like a likely likely outcome. Um, but I'm, I'm actually pretty convinced that it's it's real and uh, I don't know maybe that's just uh, bias so let me know but I guess in summary 
What do I think is going to happen in shipping? Well, I think we're in a shipping super cycle, right? And uh, recently, we've seen that that shipping super cycle has been driven by U.S. stimulus. I think that the global economy's growth is predicated on the United States' dollar for the time being. And then I think that uh, the more dollars you have, the, you tend to have more global GDP growth. I think that we are uh, entering a period similar to the 1970s where we have an expansionary demographic of U.S. population in their peak consumption years, 30-year-olds, who are going and getting loans. And because they are getting loans through the monetary system that we have, they are producing currency units. And as they produce currency units, the shipping rates, as you receive more and more inflation around the world, maybe a lot of that is exported, maybe some of it isn't. But as you uh, more and more of that, uh, those dollars are created, you'll see more GDP growth and higher shipping rates as a result. <laughs> okay, well, uh, that's the video. I hope you guys are doing uh, good and uh, let me know what you think.